Thank you all for having us here. I know we are running a little behind the schedule, so we will cut this discussion down in five minutes. Uh, what we are going to try and do, and we have some fabulous people out here, and, and I'm going to try and help all of us with the most of uh, We are talking about a subject which is, I think, more relevant today than it has been in a very long time. At the same time, it's not a subject that's new because marketers have always spent a lot of time, effort, resources, and money uh, finding ways to reach people better and, and entertain, engage, and that kind of uh, What I'm going to start with, and I think we have a fabulous mix of companies here. There is fashion, there is retail, there is technology, there is uh, what some might call B2B products and there are enough solutions on the table in the performance market that we have. So what I'm going to try and do is start by exploring the spectrum of targeting as I call it. And I think we can get to social media. Is what data-driven environments have allowed us to do is Explore the entire range of how you want to reach out to your audiences. So on one end of the spectrum, and there with this uh, sort of half visualization, but one end of the spectrum is what we've always done as marketers, and even in the days of mass media, that was possible, and it remains possible in the, in the social media environment, which is identifying the macro level of segments and doing what I would call carpet bombing to an audience where it's a bundled set of set of messages manufactured by a manufacturer and you throw it out at people hoping something will stay. The other end of the spectrum is obviously what some of us call the audience of one, which is you draw out two attributes, personas that can allow me to target a single human being with a custom user journey as you may follow. What I would like to start with, and I think there is a huge debate about which end of the spectrum is the right sweet spot for a business to sort of make it the center point of their marketing mix. What I'd like to start with is asking each of our analysts that in your particular industry and your particular business, how do you go about finding your sweet spot and if you're lucky enough to have found one, where does it sit? So, uh, so hi everyone, I'm Mr. Hunter, I'm a performance marketing agency called Adler. So, that kind of guitar gives uh, me the opportunity to work with, uh, you know, different business models, different businesses, uh, this could be B2B, B2C, each with uh, very varied KPIs. Uh, and, you know, ultimately the sweet spot boils down to what the, what the key performance indicator is. Uh, we would, you know, we manage projects like from you know, starting with the lag, lag and half, going to, you know, CR. The lag, lag and half actually allows us to think outside the box, uh, where we, you know, push ourselves to figure out how do we drive the partner's uh, KPI in that market, and then start to throw that out, versus a branding exercise, which is more engagement, impression uh, driven. So, you know, in today's day and age, uh, while we were chatting outside, when we're talking about bullseye and uh, really laser targeted uh, capabilities, this has evolved in the last 10 years. You know, when, when Google started, the targeting capability was intent. So if someone searching for blue shoes, that's your you know, bullseye targeting. Then there was location which was uh, mapped into that. Today we're in a social media world where we can target right from folks who are accessing uh, or consuming data uh, through 4G,
about you? Do I have a better message for you? Or do I have better ROI talking to people like you who are all possibly have the same interest and uh, possibly have the same motivation? So, for example, uh, when 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 does somebody want to use a product like this? Could be that I have an interest group which is about saying Friday night I want to go for a party. That's this one. But I uh, want to go for a party and therefore I'm looking for a fun back end because I really want to have my classes there. At the same time, a different set of audiences are looking at that because they also want to attend a wedding and it's a different creative, right? Uh, at the same time, there is an audience who's looking forward to a weekend with the family and therefore we need to put a solution. At the same time, there's a Preparing for an interview on a Monday and is possibly looking at the best look for that interview or for that right? uh, It is best and most efficient if I can accumulate these groups and target them at a group level rather than at an individual level. It's possible, but it just doesn't give me the value. Do you think, uh, in terms of cost per transaction, does that value play a role in the choice of the market or whether we deploy behind precision versus? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely, because at the end of the day, every person that I target has to lead to an acquisition cost. Right? The cost of targeting that person, the cost of serving that ad to that person, and taking them through the journey. If my cost of acquisition is X and my transaction value, say for argument 10X, makes sense. But if the cost of acquisition at that individual level turns out to be uh, you know, five times of what my transaction value or my lifetime value is going to be. It just doesn't make sense. I know it's, it's not a very uh, romantic question from a creative standpoint. It's a very hard fit in science. CFO kind of a question, uh, CFO kind of an answer, but our life has to play a role at the end of the day. Forgive me for calling you Karan earlier. Now I'm going to get to Karan. Uh, how, does, uh, how do you look at things in Fab India in terms of uh, the same perspective? I'll just try to clear about it again. Uh, okay, so the way the way we look at it, the way I look at it is uh, there are there are various reasons to be on digital and social. Uh, targeting is one of those reasons. Because I think as brands, when you try and be on this ecosystem, you try and be in this ecosystem for various objectives. The objectives could be very different. One objective could be just simple reach and awareness. The other objective could be engagement. The third objective could be conversion. Uh, simplistically put, three broad objectives. For each one of these three objectives, your definitions of ROI and your definitions of targeting and what kind of performance metrics <coughs> sorry, your control are very different. Um, so, as far as we are concerned, we choose our objectives marry them with platforms which are best suited to deliver those objectives uh, and set metrics in place for each objective. So, there is no simple answer to this ROI question. Now, the ROI question for an engagement campaign is very different from an ROI question on a conversion campaign. And an ROI question on conversion is very different from an ROI uh, for, for reach and awareness. Uh, your metrics of performance could vary from actual sales in case of conversion to brand uplifts in case of reach and awareness. So depending on what your objective is, you need to be picking your your courses accordingly. So like you said, it's about probably picking courses for courses. Uh, let's talk about signify. Uh, and I think you also have an interesting mix where your business has a huge amount of dependency on but also on the influencers who actually play a big role in the purchase decision. Now, tell me how does the game of targeting in your case work between these two influencers? So, as you said, we're on this uh, panel, we're one of those oldest companies were around. So, before our main page is signified, we were Philips, Philips Lighting. Uh, we like to call ourselves the 125 years old company. 25 years old startup. So we'd like to get into the startup space because uh, a lot of you might be familiar with lighting as the traditional lighting product that you bought for your home. Uh, but just for education, lighting has been a huge transition. Today we are obviously talking about connected lighting. 
Like he did a lot of things and he could actually personalize. You know, even in an office space, he's one of the people who actually used to do the same design. Today, the light setting, uh, the which you are sitting, can be personalized to give you the right colors. But that will not give you the right thing. So, we believe that digital and social especially uh, uh, goes well or delivers ROI only when it's an integral part of the overall marketing campaign, including some of those spray and play kind of media that you talked about, right? Uh, also, for us, uh, I think we don't look at social as you know, only one platform. We use different platforms differently. For example, as you said, we have a lot of B2B products and we use LinkedIn, for example, for thought leadership. So we're not even talking about the product. We're talking about technology, we're talking about innovations, you know, and those kind of platforms. Whereas, of course, on a Facebook, you have more product led, right? And uh, maybe on a Twitter, we are providing a lot of updates of what's happening in our world. So I think we are looking at all these to create different kinds of engagement uh, for the kind of audience that we have. So that you know, it's just not about the products any longer, but a lot of dialogue. You know, we, we launched a product which had a very unique shape. Now, one is to talk about that, but then we realized there was a photographer who had, you know, just like a lot of photographs in Flake out here, he had to do those lights very efficiently, and you know, he had made a video of himself saying that how this light actually helps him through the thing. So that is something which we are now trying to amplify. That's a very interesting point you made also about how it actually works in the context of an overall brand strategy where social media is one of the components. And I think uh, we feel that consistently across the organization, even in this group as we talk about, I don't think too many of us are thinking about a social strategy. Most of us are actually working towards a brand strategy and then saying, where does social property make the most sense? And from that point on, then to figure out what's the most efficient way of targeting. Now, speaking of targeting, let's come to the case of HP. Because, uh, I think by the most of any family, your profession is still calling it legacy businesses, are still in the sort of huge shadow of mass media driving a large part of the attention. HP is probably on the other end of the spectrum where a large part of their marketing dollars have always so, since both the quantum as well as the length of time that they've spent and that you must have spent working on this, are there any things which sort of HP has learned which uh, probably we haven't touched upon? I think the best part of HP is our 70% marketing dollars actually go on digital. So, I've worked across different industries, it used to be close to 20 and we used to say digital is taking too much and we don't have money left for TV and friends. But HP being because of the devices, because of the Gen Z who we are targeting for the new devices and the new technology features which is coming is also for them. And when you do more study on them, you realize they are all digital natives. So they are always on on digital. So the only way is to survive or manage the brand Relevance for them is to study them well on digital and then target them and then reach them. What we do at HP really well, and, and that's something which I would talk, where am I in this spectrum? We have very clear upper funnel and lower funnel. Upper funnel is all about brand, how do I reach, and then how do I engage with them. And each of the PG, because of the data, the big data which you have, the installed database, that's the advantage which HP has. Because all the devices you buy, they, are, they can be tracked for the serviceability aspect of it. So that becomes the big data which goes in millions. And that data can be really analyzed to actually customize it and not just customize. Customization, I would say, is old school thought. A traditional media used to segment and target and customize and position. But it's all about personalization. So this entire process of dynamic creative optimization and the programmability of the entire stuff is done really well. And that is what is the uniqueness of HP marketing. That's so, upper funnel. Right. And that's what ultimately comes back to RAD, which we call as retain and then acquire and then 
develop them further and then feed it back into the big data. You know, look, it you said about uh, HP being a data rich organization, and I completely understand that with every user you're capturing a huge amount of data. Uh, and then right next to you, we have a company which not only captures but also generates data real time. And then HP is sitting on big data, I don't know if there's a term called massive data, but let's come in there. Tell me, with the amount of information you capture as a platform already about people on your, on, your, uh, on your platform, how do you actually filter out that information overload and make sense of how to keep some sanity about that? Changes, perceptions, changes, behaviors, changes, and that's a 
believe you that we are all trying to achieve here, whether you are on the creative side or on the design side. Right? Uh, what targeting allows us to do is to tailor that story. But the story still needs to be powerful enough at the end of the day. Right? Uh, I think the biggest change that these platforms are bringing is the way people consume media. And I know that sounds very obvious, but the one big change that it makes for the marketers is that even advertising is now no longer seen as advertising. At the end of the day, advertising is content that needs to entertain people. Uh, we discussed this uh, you know, backstage that uh, uh, over time, it just seems that marketers are not really We all were guilty of that, right? We started out in the 1780s trying to entertain our audiences with interesting ads, right? And then we thought, okay, you know what? I've got that stock. Rather than spend effort and money and time on entertaining and building a great story, let me throw money behind <coughs> making sure that the consumer sees it. Uh, I think with social media, the game is changing again. Today, it just takes three seconds, according to Facebook, to, for somebody to move on to the next thing in the, in the newsfeed. The newsfeed today is just an impact problem. Right? Three seconds, that's all you have. So rather than solving for Telling your story in three seconds, I think what we need to focus on is once we have the right audience, what do we say in those first three seconds to make sure that people stay on for the balance 27 seconds or 57 seconds or 10 minutes? Well, that's a good point you're making because uh, there's a lot of conclusions being drawn versus the restrictions being created by the formats that. Facebook says it's three seconds, or if YouTube is saying it's seven. I think it's also a function of the model we draw out of that story, which is, is that the time I have to vomit my entire message? Or is that the time I have to actually capture somebody's attention? So that they are intrigued enough to actually hear the rest of what I have to say. Now, while the storytelling becomes, therefore, a tad more complex to hold people's attention in such a multiple setting. The other aspect of targeting is also bringing back the journeys to consumption funnels and, and, and sales, which is where probably businesses which have a pure online or a pure offline footprint have had legacy metrics of measuring that. Uh, let me talk about the retail footprint of Fab India. And of course, all the messaging and targeting that you do on social media. Eventually, the metric of success is how many footfalls does it drive in your stores. How do you draw correlations and conclusions on ROI in that context? I'm glad you asked this question. Hello? I'm glad you asked this because uh, I think for businesses like ours, which have very large physical uh, one of the key challenges always has been and will continue to be to drive best uh, returns from the investments that you made in real estate. Uh, and I think there are two ways of, of dealing with this situation. One way of dealing with this situation is to ensure that people that you already have shopping at your stores uh, return to your stores more frequently and buy at a greater volume and value. Uh, the other challenge, of course, is to get new people to enter your stores. Uh, as first-time shoppers and get them to obviously purchase. Uh, one of the ways, one of the ways in which we've tried to deal with this is, you know, using the large database that we have of shoppers with us, the mobile numbers, for example, that people share with us, and use that as a device to uh, target current shoppers on, let's say, platforms like like Facebook, where you are able to reach out to your current uh, consumer, your current shopper. Uh, through custom targeting and get them to consume ads or get them to consume stories or communications which drive the brand message which could sometimes be on just purpose-led storytelling or sometimes could be on trying to convert a particular occasion of sale. Thereafter, also to use what you use for custom targeting to create uh, mirror audiences, the lookalike audiences. Now, these are people who are not your shoppers or your current shoppers. But these are people who exhibit a certain amount of similarity in terms of interests, likes, predispositions. 
and then offer to get them to also be some communication, which you think is going to be of relevance to them. The trick in all of this, of course, is to personalize that communication. Personalize that communication as best as you can, face it uh, And then, after you look at what kind of lifts you have on, on both salience, which can be captured online as well, as well as actual conversion and stores. Uh, those are some of the things that we've done in the past. Like we've done it now in the last couple of years. And it's worked out pretty well. So, if I'm going to actually add to that, uh, if your business model is obviously a little more complex because you are having engagements on social but measuring impact and so on. Uh, if you look at an organization like HP, it actually gets a little more complex than that because your retail footprint is physical, digital, Within e-commerce, it's exclusive versus multi brand And of course, there is the personalization that you spoke about, that there is stopping of the funnel storytelling, which is about awareness, equity, and brandy. And then there is the bottom of the funnel, which is driving people closer towards the transaction. Now, if the Fab India matrix is a two by two matrix, yours is a lot more complicated. How difficult does that make? Optimization in, in, in your course. I would answer this in two parts. One is definitely storytelling. Because ultimately, more you are going through big data, more you are trying to customize, personalize the messages, more it's like overload of information which lacks emotions, which ultimately doesn't bind people and drive preference any which way. It's driven a lot by a lot what's what's on the offer. So more online, more on offer. That's why Mitra and everyone they have got used to getting such good deals there on. And it's very difficult to actually satisfy customers and consumers there. So it's important to balance the mix of what does the brand really stand for with the storytelling and ultimately drive conversion. So, a um, little bit of difference I have in some of the panelists which spoke there that what do I capture in three seconds? Actually, I can't capture anything in three seconds. And we recently did an experiment with Diwali when we were doing this ad for um, uh, humanity and how technology can help bridge humanity. I was really surprised that in this era where no one is concerned about what's happening to humanity. Suddenly the video was actually 45, it, it was 45 second video and we could see the traction going on those content too. A lot of videos which we post online also is close to one minute. We were posting a video on security in your devices. That video was close to one minute 30 seconds and I could see good traction. And then there are videos which I do wherein even 5 seconds people don't want to see. So now, is it is it three second philosophy? Is it storytelling? I would say it's storytelling. It's still powerful. And how do I actually track that? More powerful is my story. Better is my dynamic creative optimization. That is where I can actually personalize from the same story. How do I make it relevant to you in that context? And then finally say how much I can drive the lower funnel, which is which is the ROI. Now ROI is always very, very driven by sales and there is a separate motion and funnel which we need to run very, very effectively. So I have a mix and match model like Fab India, there is SMS and then there is retailers and people and customers really. That is a hygiene which we have to manage. There is no running away from it to drive ROI. Can change that? Yeah, I just want to, uh, I think it's a point that's very important. We made slightly earlier as well. I just want to reiterate on that. Uh, from a targeting point of view, from a social digital media presence from storytelling. And both have their own place under the sun. I couldn't agree more. Both have their place under the sun, but both are very different animals and need to be dealt with very differently. So why in the case of broadcast advertising? And broadcast advertising can happen on social digital as well. There's no reason why it should be done in newspapers and then periods. There is also this challenge of you know, what interest will I get for the first 3 seconds, 5 seconds, 7 seconds, something such that I think and can't be more 
is not about what you're delivering in the three seconds, but it is about are those three seconds good enough for you to get the person hooked on for the balance 27 seconds. If those three seconds are not good enough, then the rest is 20 seconds, seconds and uh, 27 seconds, and then we see. But that's advertising. On the storytelling, and we do a lot of that in Tapu as well. We do a lot of stories which are a minute, a minute and a half, in some cases even three minutes, which are about craft trails. How is Indian made? How is chicken curry made? How does a craft cluster work? How does a carnival work? Some of these stories are longer format stories, relatively longer format stories. You know, anywhere between two minutes to an hour and three minutes. And these stories have got fabulous, fabulous views, fabulous engagement, fabulous comments, fabulous shares. So I think there is a difference, and I just want to reiterate that. That advertising and storytelling are different things, they don't necessarily need to get mixed up with each other. And depending on what the objective is, there are ways of handling and with that success. And I think in today's environment, I, I absolutely agree, because in today's environment, a brand cannot afford to be on a spectrum of looking at that as a leader of It's got to be looking at the whole touch point environment in a way that I can actually start the story in a place. It's like any great story has three parts, right? Set up, conflict, and resolution. Today, what you can do is actually use the touch point diversity to make your overall story travel across platforms and make it more intriguing rather than draw the line with formats and let them be a divide. Let me come back to the company that's been doing both advertising and storytelling for 120 years. Shukantam, uh, um, some people would say, and look, I know I can vouch for it firsthand how exciting the category. But to an average person, there's also a risk of eventually being an electrician or a carpenter or something. How do you deal with the subject of engaging people through stories rather than interrupting them with a message? So, so as I said, Kuran has been talking about this also, and I think other people are talking about it. Both have their space, and, 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 and storytelling clearly is. Uh, Area which we are actively using on the social media uh, platforms. Uh, then we have a, uh, you know, if you talk about just not, you know, we were talking a lot outside of this, but my home, I talked to the electrician, but let me give a more complex example. So, when I am sitting at Roman, we were uh, lucky enough to get the opportunity to write up the uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan. Now, the customer is up to the Rashtrapati. But uh, the work has been done by the Central Public Sports Department, CBWD, and there's a contractor. It cares for the audience of one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. And uh, everybody has their own, uh, you know, uh, preferences, uh, what they want to see, because uh, uh, architecture and lighting is as they do as the there's no uh, science behind it. Uh, uh, luckily for us, I think, you know, a lot of the government officials today are also on these platforms. Is not in you know, somewhere we think they are all fuzzy daddy, but etc. But you know, some of these officers are very, are very computer handles, are very, a lot of promotions. And they pick up stories of what has happened when you know, we have built up such historical monuments elsewhere. And you know, when the users that are creating that content and telling us the stories, they become powerful media to reach. For example, if there's an architect involved, another architect talking about how he has used these. But sometimes you know, we are not even mentioned in those stories, which is fine with us. Okay. We are looking at the impact out there. And those user generated stories are what you know, actually gets them hooked up and we try to play on that versus our own stories And the more we can get them to talk about it, I think that's a, we have seen a lot of success. So let me now bring us back to it. I love how we, we started with an extremely rational subject of data and how we are now into the romantic space of storytelling. Let me bring it back right to the data and question and question to you. Uh, where most marketers obviously are spending a lot of imagination in finding and telling those stories. There almost seems to be this uh, sort of drive between the beautiful world of stories and the statistical world. Would you want to talk about any example or a case where you may have 
never actually seen a happy planet in the world. Yeah. Uh, I, I do, in fact. So, uh, and I call that storyboarding. So, from storytelling, uh, if we are doing you know, a good job of it, you want to start to storyboard it. And the recent example is a campaign that we did about six months ago, over a period of six months with an insurance company, uh, starting with Father's Day, uh, moving on to Raksha Bandhan and then to Bali. And what we did for the first time for them, or even the brand tried out, was so we did uh, digital first videos. So these didn't air offline. Uh, this was for production on social media. And then we said, hey, why don't we bucket? Uh, why don't we bucket this campaign into two parts? One is performance, very performance driven, which is even though it's a video, we want to generate quotes, we want to generate insurance uh, goals for you and then the other is a brand play and based on these two segments we make a decision on whether we want to do the same thing again uh, pick one market work versus the other uh, was, was, was the general preference so when we launched the Father's Day campaign folks that had viewed that video for about 10 seconds uh, saw the second one and the ones that saw both saw the third one and then the brand money that was put was like an AB test was was you know your your show up uh, show up and throw up or you know pre and spray model. And obviously the the story morning worked out because this is someone that engaged with the brand video for the first time. There was recall again engaged again, uh, the same people, and then the third time over again. So there was there was a strong brand recollection that happened uh, from that perspective, and not to mention obviously uh, you know performance metrics. So what you would have done with three videos setting aside the same amount of budget, uh, aimlessly hitting a bar on the folks that didn't watch it for more than ten seconds, like you know bounced off at three seconds, or respect to our So a lot of you know performance efficiencies were drawn into that. So you know I think there is. There's a marriage between uh, storytelling, storyboarding, and data, which is what again, you know, is your bullseye uh, mark. So, if um, and I like the way the sequential stories and if you were to look at it from a cost point of view, you literally argue that uh, for every subsequent piece of story, because of the impact of the story I created, your cost per view or your cost per read progressively started. So why don't let's start with this, I think uh, the big and the company which does partly because of the business it's in and I think fashion lends itself naturally to both great visual content as well as the entire mythology and storytelling of fashion. And Mintra obviously has been probably one of the earliest companies of the block when it comes to customizing, entertaining and Content for people and literally using that to not only entertain them but also drive value to the series. Uh, is there any example from your experience that you want to talk about where, again, this happy coming together of, of data and mythology worked really well for the I think uh, customizing the messages is an extremely important part of our uh, campaign marketing. You know, and as I, I was sharing with you, you know, backstage also one of our biggest events is we have been uh, In June last year, in uh, when we did that sale, um, we after we had a clarity on what's the overarching theme of the campaign, then uh, we looked at a lot of our data. You know, both from a you know psychographic standpoint as well as from the actual purchase behavior standpoint, and uh, we were able to create you know. Uh, almost 30 to 40 segments or micro segments of consumers. For each micro segment, uh, depending on the context in which they would want to see the content or the message and the kind of message that they want to see in that context, uh, as well as add to that a layer of the kind of visual imagery that can go along well with that you know, context. Uh, 
uh, we created almost close to you know 40,000 different creatives, you know, uh, to serve those uh, sort of segments, the remote segments. Uh, now, um, and when, when we sort of looked at the entire ROI funnel at the end of the campaign, I think uh, there was a two x dip which happened particularly because of being able to get the right context. Uh, and if we had done nothing but just put in the right context, we would have hopefully, hopefully got that lift. But there was a 4x lift, you know, because we were able to customize the creative both visually and from a copy standpoint for that customer. Just put it on your point earlier as well. I think, and I think, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, technology allows you to automate a lot of these things now, which is the beauty of it, right? You would have really desired to do this by having like hundreds of people in your team to be able to do that on a regular basis. Tech allows you to do that, and I think it's getting into a zone where you can really beautifully marry the emotion and psychographic data, uh, which comes from offline research a lot, with the transactional data from the online, uh, and you know really get the right message across. And that's something we are trying to do at scale now with every last campaign that we do. So to round things up, I'm going to ask you one rapid fire question. I need a one word answer from each of you. Imagine this as a Venn diagram where one circle is the whole universe of social media content. And the other circle is the entire universe of precision targeting that data fuels us to. What's the one word you put at the intersection of the two? I need a one word answer. In any particular order. Context. Fabulous. What else? And after this, we are opening up for, I think we have time for probably two questions. Uh, one word. I closed an outside earlier. You didn't tell us about this question before that. So, you didn't tell us actually. And I gave you the answers that would be the Venn diagram. So, let me just sum up the few words that I thought stuck out in. Personalization is one clear theme which I think all of you laid a lot of emphasis on. Drawing the difference between communication and content, which is messaging versus entertainment, I think is another thing we need to uh, The one word that actually I would put in the middle of the middle of the two words is going to be empathy towards the two universes and lensing everything point of view of the consumers we wish to serve rather than the customers we wish to provide. And I think any brand that's drawing that line very well is where the, that was like the company about the success of the well, So with that, uh, we could take probably two questions if there are any, or we could get out of the and put you into the next session. Yes, please. Could somebody hand that in? <coughs> Could you also point out to which panelist would you want to address your question? Still not watched, so <laughs> I like it. Yeah. 
I would say as consumer, make the job of marketers easier. Once you've seen the ad four times, at least buy. Or at least give a comment to it, at least do something about it. Otherwise, you'll be haunted by 15 times. But on a serious note, uh, from marketing point of view, obviously if I want it, I know that at least four to five times because you're also busy, there are multiple things, there are too many priorities and you might forget. Right? So if you add it to a cart, it's my job to remind you, you might have forgotten. I would remind you three times, four times, but even if you have still not done it, then I would rather save my money and target those who are really interested. At least they have responded. So that's where the media optimization on social media can be done. Beyond that, it depends. If, if the, the brand wants to target 10 times, 15 times, it's, it depends on what's the KPI of that. So, so for me, it would also depend on uh, you know, what the category is, what the brand is, whether it's a new brand, whether it's an established brand, and so on. So typical media principles is apply for media advertising. The, re the reason why you decide for certain brands and certain campaigns, you need a three plus versus a seven plus. Similar things you would apply even on a digital campaign. One last question. Yes. Uh, my question is to ask Nelevan. Nelevan talked about uh, getting the data for the millions of customers that you have, or the services, which you eventually would use for marketing. Now, my question comes from the likes of Gary Plug in, into the European Union, but we may expect something of the same kind to kind of transfer to India very soon, because most of the companies are working from India. So, how do you deal with this kind of scenario when, when you will have to face it eventually? Tell before you answer that question, let me compliment that gentleman for breaking it up. Because, to be honest, that deserves a session of its own. And we consciously chose 45 minutes is probably not enough time to do justice to it, but we would give one good response. It's a brilliant and relevant question today on because social media and the importance of it. The devices which we bring to consumers has all security and privacy because of the same factor. Uh, on social media, you can reach to the people only who have consented. If you have not consented, we can't reach. Right? And you always have an option. Any website, be it any of the players, any of the competition brands which we see, any of the other brands which you want to buy, there's always a clause you have to check whether you agree or you disagree. The moment you disagree, we don't reach you. Right? So GDPR is strong and HP actually follows that very clearly globally. In India too, it's applicable. It's not that in India it's not applicable. So that's taken care of. Having said that, the people who are interested to know more, it's important as a brand to reach them because they are interested to know more. The people who are interested to get more customized messages rather than irrelevant messages to them. It's important that we serve them messages and content which is relevant to them. And the moment you find the content relevant, it's important I keep you interested in my brand. So I will keep serving you the content, which is actually then engaging to you for the brand. And once you are too interested to buy my product, I have to serve you an option to buy the product as well. So the tracking of the journey will happen to the database where they have consented. Did I answer you? Yeah, if I can just cap that off, I think uh, the aspect of consent, and this is something we are proactive, proactively recommending to most of our clients. Permission is a tricky subject, um, and it boils down to the soul of the organization of how engaging stroke interrupted you want. And I think responsible organizations are already moving towards the principle of opt in rather than opt out which is where you are seeking permission and not presuming it. And I think at a fundamental level while policies and laws will take their time to evolve. At a principal level, that's the choice every company needs to make and then act according to it. And while it may make a difference to your transactions, it can also have a reverse impact on your equity. And it's for the company to choose what's important. And if I may just... 
if I may just bring that back to targeting, I think it's a tussle between how much are you legally or regulatory wise allowed to know about a consumer versus as a brand, how much can you let on to the consumer that you know about them. Right? So ultimately if you you I can personally target because you're saying that you know what, you're going to this conference or how about dress for it, but that's just me. Yeah, and just really quickly, I, you know, this is a conversation I, I was having uh, uh, at a different conference, but huge to this is, you know, we were talking about how ad blocking is, is bad for business, whereas it's not. It's actually, it's, it's awesome because you don't want to show an ad or to someone who's already not, not in the game to actually see the ad. So, I feel, you know, brands are understanding that, respecting, you know, the lines that are being drawn by consumers, uh, you know, frequency capital is in place uh, for that gentleman over there who's continuously seeing the same ad. So, brands are adopting to do that, uh, because it's, it's beneficial for, for both sides of the table. Great, so with that, I think we're really run out of our time. You can continue that over the bar in the next five minutes. I'm going to really have to wrap this session. Thank you guys for being a fabulous audience.